This podcast is brought to you by Ventilect, your tech recruitment partner for a changing world. Welcome to Ventilect's Building Our World podcast, the show where I speak to people building and developing the teams and technology that are changing our world. It's no secret, hiring and retaining top technical talent is really difficult, but it's essential for companies to get right so they can continue to innovate and keep moving forward. So how do we get there? Well, I'll be speaking to the talent and recruitment leaders, engineering managers, and more to hear how they do it. So hopefully you can learn a few things to take to the company you work at to level up your tech hiring and retention. What I love about technology, and we've seen this now more than ever, it's changing and evolving so rapidly. But for any of the innovation we see to happen, you need the best people in the best teams. So hopefully this podcast can be a place where we can learn how to do just that. Yes, this is a podcast where I want everyone to learn, but we've got some great guests lined up and I think there'll be a few stories out there that we can uncover as well. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to this week's episode. Today, I'm joined by Moses Season, a heavily experienced recruitment and talent acquisition leader. He's been in the industry since 2005, starting out an agency before going in-house to build some of the best internal recruiting functions in San Francisco. He's seen different economic cycles, tech at its worst and at its best, and that is why I wanted to get him on the show today to share all that, to give some perspective. But also, Moses is really passionate about building inclusive workplaces. Now, I've worked with a lot of companies and a lot of them say they want to do that, but they never quite get there. So I wanted to dig into how he views an inclusive recruiting process, and maybe you can learn a few things from his career and story as well. I really hope you learn from this episode. So without further ado, I'm Alex Boise, And this is Ventilec's very own podcast. Moses, we are live. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Alex? I'm all good. I'm all good. I wanted to start off because we were saying just off air that we first spoke, I think, over a month ago. Uh, And obviously, you're based over in the Valley. I'm based in London. And it's fair to say a lot has happened on both sides of the Atlantic in that time in tech, Um, but especially where you are as well. So for those that don't know, if anyone's been living under a rock in in tech, we had the Silicon Valley Bank collapse and a lot of layoffs and things like that. So what's it been like being there, working sort of, you know, I know pretty much everyone where you are works in tech, as you said yourself, you know, you go to a party and you're going to meet a software engineer. So so how's it all been these last few weeks? I mean, to say that a lot has happened is somewhat of an understatement, right? There's the second largest bank failure in the world just happened a mile away from my office, right? Silicon Valley Bank is right next to the, the Palo Alto office of my company, Autonomic. And in terms of layoffs, I mean, just Facebook alone did 21,000 in the last few months, not to mention Netflix, Amazon, Google, et cetera. I think the only one that hasn't, the only giant that hasn't uh, done any layoffs are is, is Apple, right? Uh, but from what I heard internally, what they're doing over there is they're just not hiring and they're not backfilling. Yeah. People leave, they stay, they stay gone, right? People, managers are not getting any new backfills or they're not hiring. Uh, it's been It's been rough just because... I know quite a bit of the folks that were affected, majority of the people, uh, even at Facebook were in recruiting talent acquisition. So it's, it's been closer to heart than other layoffs and other things in the past. Hmm. But at the end of the day, I think it's a needed market correction. Uh, there was a market correction in a lot of different sectors during the pandemic, but I think tech, being able to work from home didn't really skip the beat and they kept going, they kept growing and growing. And now, you know, they're just, they're just seeing that, that correction in the market. So. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. It is. And I think maybe where, where you are as well in the Valley, 
you know, it's a case of the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Um, yeah. It's always been the number one tech hub, the most money, the biggest companies. It's always going to grab the most headlines as well. Um, but yeah, when I'm speaking to people, so obviously we speak to a lot of people in European tech, UK and US as well. And um, when I speak to people in US, especially on the West Coast, they're a bit more sort of down, not downbeat, but a little more cautious about things. Um, and I think you were saying um, off air as well, there's a big concentration where you are. There's the, the diversification of industries isn't really a thing where you are right now. Especially in the Bay Area. It's majority tech workers, right? The cost of living here is extremely high. I think one of the highest in the nation. I think we recently just beat out New York City, Manhattan proper wow. as one of the most expensive places in terms of real estate, in terms of a price of a bagel, <laughs> in terms of a price of a cup of coffee. Um, so tech salaries tend to be quite high and that's why they gravitate towards their area, this area. Um, so it's it's being affected. We're being mm. affected quite quite heavily when mm. it comes to the downturn. Well, nothing lasts forever. Everything is a moment in time, and uh, yeah, this is one of those. But yeah, I think it w it was a much needed correction. And if you think about it, you know, back in two thousand and eight, they had an IT correction as well during the pandemic. They had essential workers, service industries had some correction, and after that that industry found faults or problems within it and it fixed it for the service industry it's wages okay. so people thought the thought that they can keep paying the same wage and people mm -hmm. just didn't want to work that <laughs> work in the same wage anymore but they still need the service industry i was a bartender and a a, a waiter all throughout college so i understand that industry uh, mm -hmm. In the finance sector, if there's a financial crash, New York, one of the biggest financial hubs here, they experience a slowdown too. So like you said, nothing's going to last forever. And I think I, I think it's interesting seeing the reactions of newer folks in the recruiting industry who has only seen an upward tick in hiring. They've never yeah. really seen a downturn, and now they're being laid off. Now they're starting to really realize why recruiting or why, why talent acquisition is paid a premium because of the volatility mm. surrounding it. I don't think the, the more the folks that have been in the industry for less than five years really understood that volatility, that you're the first team, one of the first teams to go when the company decides to slow down, which, yeah. which absolutely makes sense, right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, uh, I mean, so many people joined recruitment as a career. I mean, most people maybe from, you know, when you got back into the game was fell into recruitment and just kind of maybe were in, went into an agency or went into HR and transitioned to recruiting. But maybe past five years, people have actively pursued it because of these big salaries and uh, these premiums and all this kind of the good stuff. I think it's the same with anything. Like you see it with... I don't know, like people investing in Bitcoin when the price is going up. You get the sure. people that kind of will join to kind of jump on the train, um, but they're the first ones to drop off when things slow down. And it's the same, I suppose, with investments and careers. Um, and yeah, I mean, I spoke to a t another talent leader. <laughs> I won't say his name, but he's uh, he was a director of talent. And maybe you went through this situation as well. He was interviewing for talent. TA people for his team last year, probably when demand was really tight mm. and people were asking for like two, 150, 200 K salaries. And he was just thinking, you're not that good. Like yeah. what's going on? You're not that good. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's like, there's a bubble. <laughs> and there was, there was, and it popped mm. and it popped. Um, again, I think you hit the nail right on the head. People were, romanticizing the idea of the recruiting talent acquisition field, right? A uh, high comp, uh, when you worked at Facebook, from what I've heard, they, it, it was a bloated recruiting organization and some of them didn't even do anything, right? They were hired to hire, but then a recruiting freeze or a hiring freeze happened. 
they're left twiddling their thumbs. Even, mm-hmm. even if you're good, if you don't have any recs to work on, how can you show how amazing you are as a recruiter? Right. Um, you're an amazing podcast podcast host, but if you don't have anybody to interview, what yeah. are you going to do? <laughs> right? Yep. I'll just have to preach, preach on my own. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There yeah. you go. It's, it's, I, saw it on, yeah. I saw it on the agency side as well. So people, maybe even after COVID during that bounce back, people would join these agencies and earn pretty good commission and not have to work that hard and yeah they're the first ones to go you know when when times get tough so yeah it, it's something it needed to happen and this is sort of the first cyclical recession i'm going through in terms of my like adult career i was sure. uh, i think i was about 14 when 2008 happened so i, I was oblivious yeah. to it um and, and I, I now i'm sort of going through it I can see why recessions are necessary. There needs to be a reallocation of capital and almost a reallocation of people's expectations from life and their work um, on, a, on a much more sort of human psychological level. Uh, so, yeah, I think that there is a need for these corrections, but, yeah, it's not a painless thing either. No, no. Corrections and change hurts, but nothing nothing lasts forever. And I, I do lean towards... I have a, a soft part of my heart for folks who started out as an agency recruiter because it can be a tough world in an agency recruiter. You're typically a no-name company reaching mm-hmm. out to bigger companies to see if you can work with them because if you see if you can send a candidate that you would you know that you think would be a good fit, et cetera, you're running your own desk, right? You're the salesperson, yep. you're the sorcerer. Sometimes you can be the coordinator as well. You're doing everything and anything. And then you go into it corporate and it's a it's a different ball game but Mm -hmm. the hustle and the rigor that you develop at an agency where you're hunting and you're not eating if you don't kill sorry for the (laughs) the vivid vivid, uh metaphor but i i tend to hire a lot of those types of folks that started their career at an agency maybe that's a maybe that's a halo bias on my end because I started out as an agency. Yeah. So let's <laughs> let's get on to that. Um, let's so obviously very successful recruitment career, risen the ranks, um, and done a lot. So yeah, I mean, how did it all start for you? How did you get into this wacky world of recruitment? Wacky indeed. Um, I did not know about the recruiting field. I actually graduated with a marketing undergrad, and I wanted to get into marketing, but I wanted to not only look for a job by myself, I wanted other folks to help me. So I went to different agencies, recruiting agencies to say, hi, this is my resume. I graduated marketing and help me find a job. (laughs) Uh, Well, they didn't, but they did call me for a recruiting job. We don't have anything for you, but we have this junior recruiter role. You'll be working with X company. And you know what? I said to myself, why not? Let's try it out. And what year was this? What year was this? Uh, (laughs) Sorry to. uh... (laughs) I I need to look at my LinkedIn profile in order to tell you exactly what year. That was uh, a deco. And that was back in, I want to say, 2005. What a year. Wow. Yeah, (laughs) 2005. And the funny thing is, I ended up recruiting for Google at a deco. Yeah, you might be too young to remember, but Google had this one project. It's called the Google Book Project. And they wanted to scan every single book in the world and digitize it. Oh, okay. And we were recruiting for that. So low level, low skill folks, but a lot of work and a lot of volume. Ultimately, it got cut due to copyright reasons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's where I cut my teeth in recruiting. Then I went to Tech System, which is another agency, and that's where I learned a lot of my tech background, um, Java developers, Scala engineers, back when Scala was a thing in the database side. Uh, and it really, again, taught me that rigor. And folks, people that I've uh, I've worked with at Google ended up reaching out to me while I was at Tech System, so I ended up working at Google after that. Okay. Yeah. And was that around that 2008, 2009 time that you made that jump? Yeah, exactly. 2008, 2009 time 
is when okay. I ended up working at Google for about a year, then went to Adobe as the executive sourcer, executive recruiter. And this is where I think my shyness on the phone really went away because I needed to chat with VPs of finance from Yahoo. And I needed to talk to someone, you know, who's a senior director at Oracle, who's 30, 40, 50 years older than me. I was, I was quite the young guy back then. And the level of confidence that I got from that job is irreplaceable. I think that's really where I turned. And then I saw how an executive at these Fortune 100 companies operated. The, the 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 work ethics that they have the way the speech pattern the way they spoke right so it's it's a turning point in my career at adobe so what did they do in terms of the way they spoke what changed for you to well, get this confidence they enunciated how about that mm. <laughs> when when they spoke it was a lot of not a lot of filler words, right? You start to understand that they took management classes, that they know when to stop, breathe. Mm. You understood when you ask them a question, they don't necessarily just answer right off the bat. If they need time, they have tactics and ways to circumvent your questions or maybe even just pause and think about what, what their answer is going to be. Mm. Right? For engineers and folks who don't really get interviewed often, they don't develop that skill. They don't need it. If you're a software yep. engineer, you're an architect, you don't need any of that. You just kind of do your work and be amazing and you're good. Um, but these executives really kind of taught me, wow, I, I can change my speech pattern. I can change kind of all of these things to be more professional. Yeah. So that was good. Well, you speak very well. And actually doing this podcast um, myself over time, I definitely could see when I was listening to recordings back filler words and just if you can say more like with less words it's the same in copywriting we do a lot of work on copywriting now oh, mm -hmm. um, in terms of obviously our sales emails our job adverts and just agonizing over every single word does it need to be there um, is there a way you can put it and I think that's a real art and the same in speech um, it's it's a real art form the trick is not to let it bleed out when you're just talking to friends. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to turn off your yeah. work, your work voice, right? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting, especially when you're working from home. Yes, definitely. So you were at Adobe and then you got your first taste and you were still an individual recruiter at this point? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And this is back in 2008, 2009. And we were just kind of talking about that's when a recession happened in tech. Uh, I was hit as part of uh, part of that recession. It was so I ended up taking a contract role at a company called Silver Spring Networks. They did um, they do infrastructure, electrical work. They work with uh, major manufacturer, major uh, electrical companies like PG&E, things like that. And I did an HR generalist role. So that's my first taste when it comes to HR operations, onboarding, um, gathering information, I-9, background checks, drug tests, all of those things. Uh, and I think, you know, I wanted to and, and eventually pursue that career, but I was reached out to to be a lead recruiter by a company called Rock U. And this is the time when Facebook advertising started to grow, started to oh, get yeah. big right? 2010, everybody was into Facebook advertisement. Everybody wanted to have little Facebook mini games. I'm sure you, you were, you were playing at this at this point. Yes, definitely. There was, there was the, um, and you get a notification every time someone was playing. Exactly. Or ask <laughs> your friends for lives. Yeah. Right? Ask your friends for a refill on candy crush. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Angry birds, right? This is, Rovio was a big Farmville. Company. I remember Farmville. Farm Yes, yeah, see? Well, again. Farmville. Uh, I worked for a company called Rocky who had those types of games, and I recruited quite a bit. Uh, we were competing with a massive company called Zynga. I'm sure you've probably heard of the company called yeah. Zynga. And then after that, I actually wanted to leave the recruiting 
um, the recruiting field. So I went to get a master's uh, in accounting. Okay. <laughs> Uh, at some point, you're like, hey, you know what? I'm tired of people. I just want to sit down, look at numbers, be an auditor, and you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to interact. You don't have to call folks. You don't have to talk to people. Um, and you know what, Alex? I hated it. It was the worst type of job for me because you went from being a recruiter who's generally well-liked because you got them the job, right? You ran them through the interview process. And for existing employees, you're helping them hire. So for the most part, people in the company generally like you. Then you yeah. became an auditor. <laughs> you know who likes auditors? No one. <laughs> no one likes people who correct your work, who look at your work and say... Yeah, snooping hey, around, busybodies, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But that's their job. They're just mm. So what they would do is they put you in a small little room where, yeah. you know, it's cold and they don't make you comfortable because they just want you to be in, out and be done. So mm. complete 180 from, you know, the world that I'm used to. So ended up leaving that and then became a senior recruiter at Quinn Street and Quinn Street specialized in advertising as well, but uh, Google ads. So they own companies like insurance.com okay. and when you were typing for insurance you would kind of land on insurance.com and in its affiliate site they send out all your information to all of these other um, insurance company and you get the best quote right great company met a lot of amazing people then after that uh i i work in the valley so i had to try a very very small startup company i was the fourth employee at a company called Graph Science, where they did Facebook social analytics, right? Um, mm -hmm. Them looking at the data, analyzing the demographic that comes into Facebook, all the metadata that goes wrong with it. We hired a bunch of computer scientists, things like that. And then uh, I finally ended up finding a place where I stayed on for about four and a half years. Uh, at the time, it was called Fire Spotter Labs. Uh, we had two name changes, and right now they're called Dialpad. They're still they're still up and running. They have about three thousand employees now. Very proud of the work that I did there. Grew it from about twenty four employees to around three hundred and fifty. After four and a half years, I needed to um, hand it off to someone, and mm -hmm. she's been an amazing HR person there. Uh, and we keep in touch. So Dialpad was an exciting time in my life, and then. Vungle, Unity, and now I'm at Autonomic. Amazing. Yeah. So to have this impact, obviously you've helped hire tons of people, helped companies go through some incredible growth. To have that impact on that scale, you know, it's not you by your laptop, on a phone, pounding, getting candidates through. You know, it has to be bigger than that. You have to build a function. You have to build a team. Um so I, I would love to kind of dig into, I mean, how did you deal with that transition from being an individual recruiter and contributor where you can have that sort of impact, you can measure your impact, to now sort of growing a team and a function and having a more sort of holistic approach to things? Because I speak to many and I speak to many on this podcast for, for regular listeners who really struggle with that transition because it's it's harder to measure and we like stuff we can measure. Absolutely. Um, it was very challenging for me. Uh, and a few factors played on those challenges. One, like you said, the lack of metrics, right? Or the second piece is you're now not only gauged on your own performance, but other people's performance. Um, and then also on top of that, it can get fairly lonely. How many managers, how many directors do you need in a company? Typically mm. one or two in, in, this, in the industry or in that function. Uh, you don't want to vent to your employees. You don't want to necessarily vent to your boss if you don't have a great relationship with that person. Now let's talk about laterally. You don't also want to try to vent too much Mm -hmm. on your lateral coworkers, other directors in the team. Maybe you do, but maybe you don't. At the end of the day, there's very little folks. There's not a lot of folks that you can have just a 
beer and chat with. That's uh, unlike a big recruiting org when you're an IC. Go out for drinks, you're fine, right? But you're in a manager now. <laughs> you go through harassment training. You went through, hey, it's your it's your legal responsibility to make sure that people are not intoxicated, et cetera, et cetera. And you're going to have to ex- escape out of there. And then also, you will tend to revert back to what you know in a stressful situation. You will ne- uh, You will ultimately try to replicate the way you work through the people that directly reports to you. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, at first, that's exactly what I did. My work, I, it got me here. My work ethics, the way, the, my procedures, the process, it's, just, it's super optimized in my head. And I just try to create a playbook and say, follow this playbook. But now, as I mature, as I mature in management and managing people and leading a team, you understand that people just have different ways of working and they can still be successful even if you don't they don't follow your mm. specific process do you think as well i think a lot of managers have the have this outlook that i made these mistakes when i was coming up i went through this pain and it got me to where i am today so you have to go through exactly the same pain and make the same mistakes to, to reach that next level as well. I think that's a big thing in management and only natural. I mean, I see the same with, with the team I'm bringing on. I think, oh, well, I went through this, so it's good for you to go through that because you'll learn. But actually, maybe they could actually just learn from you without having to make the mistake all over again. Exactly, exactly. A smart man, uh, a smart person learns from their, their mistake. A smarter person learns from other people's mistake and don't even don't, not and don't, don't even make it themselves, right? But I think historically, in order for you to be a recruiter, you you somewhat have to learn how to push back, kind of have a personality that's fairly thick because we get a lot of rejections. You have to have a stronger personality. So sometimes it's harder to manage those folks. It's like wrangling cats is what they say when it comes to recruiting. Mm. Um, they've had different managers. Uh, they like different ways of managing. And you come in and you introduce your style of management. They might not like that. right? So w- when I first started managing, I applied that golden rule of do unto others what you want others to do unto you. Sounds good. But in reality, it's, you know, actually it's treat others the way you want to be treated. Uh, in reality, it's treat, other, treat others how they want to be treated. Because mm. every single person, you're not, you know, you might like, Alex, you might like to be treated like a athlete, right? Teasing, hey, what's going on over here? How come you missed practice? Act like a coach, a mentor. Other people might lo- want you to act more of as a supporting, supportive mentor. It's yeah. whatever they respond to is really what you need to figure out and adjust your management uh, style based on the individual needs. Mm-hmm. That's what I learned. That's what has been, that's what makes me successful now, in my opinion. And that's what, uh, what I really liked about previous managers I've had in the past. It's their ability to to adapt different, Mm. different types of people. So how do you read these people coming in? You have someone in your team, say, I don't know, a recruiter and they haven't got the hires in, in their quarter, their quota. And, you know, they're underperforming. They're coming in for their monthly quarterly meeting. How are you reading them to know what tools to use to get them to where they need to be? As a good manager, those things should never be a surprise to you, right? It should never be, um, hey, I didn't hit my hires this quarter and I missed four. And now you're just having that conversation at the end of the quarter. So you're pacing, you're, you're talking to them, you're mentoring, you're, you're looking at their pipeline. Uh, I've hired and I've hired many sales team from the ground up, from a B2C sales team to a B2B sales team. And luckily I've had close enough relationships with the sales leaders that I've convinced them to allow my recruiters to attend sales training. And by the way, it's 
uh, it's super valuable use of time Mm. for recruiters to understand how salespeople sell because they apply it to their own, to their own work. A good sales manager will never surprise their salespeople. They'll understand the trends, how it's, how it's, uh, uh, you know, forecasting hires, making sure that the metrics are there, making sure that you're able to um, measure time to hire, time to fill, you know, qu- uh, average quarterly hire, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. 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 It reminds me of a, uh, I saw a picture on LinkedIn, I think like the other day, and it was uh, a manager holding an umbrella and the rain's coming down above the umbrella and it's words like uh, pressure from the board, uh, changing goalposts of shareholders and strategies. And they're shielding all of that. And then it's their team underneath with clear workflows and strategy, all the tools they need, obstacles removed for, for doing the work. And that's the job of a great manager. It's to make the people in your team know exactly what they need to do so they can just come in and execute and all the tools and obstacles are there uh, removed to, to make it happen. So what's more important as a manager, being able to manage up or being able to manage down, right? I know I have colleagues and friends that, t- that tell me they're not good with managing people, but they're managers, but they are amazing at managing executives. So they manage up really well, but they're not mentors, right? They're not... You don't get the enjoyment of seeing someone who was struggling doing about about face and is now super successful in their career, right? They're more, here are the reports. This is what's going on, giving updates to the higher ups. Uh, So what's, what's more important? Kind of want to get your take on this, Alex. What, what's, what do you think is more important? And don't say both because you need, that's a (laughs) cop-out answer. (laughs) Uh, Well, as someone I have been that squeeze middle before Mm. um, in my old company. I I think actually managing up is more important um, because it allows you, if you can get the trust and the leverage from above, it can clear the way for you, for your team below. It's it's, it is sensitive because if you manage up and you're really good at managing up, sometimes the morale and the productivity of your team drops, Mm. right? Because you're not giving enough attention to them. Um, I'm, I'm the other way. I kind of think that managing down and making sure that your team is happy, productive, doing their work, hitting their metrics, because when would a VP of people complain or say, Hey, something is wrong. When your team is not producing, when your team is producing, you can give them an update every six months and they are like, yeah, sure. That's absolutely fine (laughs) because your team is fantastic. I don't need to hear from you. I don't need, you know, too many info, too much information. Just tell me that this headcount you will hit by the end of this quarter go. Right. So it can go both ways, but I really had to, to develop that muscle of, of um, managing up Mm. because I was always very good at managing my team, but sharing that information, making sure that my boss is not surprised, making sure that they know what's going on in my, in my organization at all times. Newer managers can sometimes feel that when your boss is asking you for something, that there's a, there's a malicious intent in there, or there's, Mm. there's, Hey, do you not trust me for not doing my work? No, I just want to know what is going on in your org because it's also part of mine and I answer up, I answer to whoever and I need to, all that information. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I, I have that viewpoint myself because when I first started management, um, I, was, I had like 10 months experience as an yeah. agency and they needed to grow really quickly. So I obviously f- still felt very junior and I was like a very junior manager. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you want to get the people above you on side and I suppose you want to learn from them as well. So yeah. What happens, if, what happens to the people above you are not very good? Well, exactly. Ah, see? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We've all had that experience. Mm. 
Well, now with my own agency, I am that person who's nah. above now. So it's like, yeah, I have to. One thing I've definitely realized making that transition from being a manager in an agency to having my own agency and growing a team now is that your company really is only as good as the thoughts that come out your brain and the people you hire and the thoughts that come out of their brain. Because if I have a decision and I'm not very good at something, that can filter down pretty quickly and sway. If that minus 10% of five people, that's a big difference. And yeah, you think about that a lot. The culture of your company, for the most part, is the average personality of your leadership, right? Mm. If you have a leadership that all came from a sorority and they're very, or, uh, you know, kind of that bro-ish mentality. And I have seen this, well, guess what? The culture of your company is going to be that of kind of a bro-ish company. If they all came from Harvard and they're very academia focused, well, guess what? Your company's culture is going to be very academic base, right? Amazon does their massive reviews when they have to, in order for you to get a, uh, um, a raise, you have to write as a manager, essentially an essay, a report, and you have to get that peer reviewed and you have to get those peer reviewed approved by several other folks. I mean, it's like writing a thesis, mm. you get your degree to have someone in your team, either get a promotion or, um, get a, a, a raise, right? So, yeah. because they come from more of that academic background, a lot of them did. Well, this brings me on to the next topic I wanted to pick your brains on mm. building inclusive workplaces, something I know you're passionate about. Um, and this kind of ties into your leadership team do need to be diverse. They need to be from different backgrounds and think differently. Um, I'm seeing this myself as I, as I build my company. Um, and I do, when I do, sometimes I jump in and do some direct sourcing for like graduates, um, sure. for, to join me. And it's so much easier to get someone who looks like me, who's just basically the younger version of me to buy into me and to reply to my message. Cause I know what that person r roughly wants to hear. Yeah. Um, and you know, something we're working on in terms of inclusive language in our job descriptions and emails, because you know, obviously I want people who are different to me to respond to me as well, but it's just a much easier sell if they're, you know, a 21 year old sees, I'm 28 now, sees a 28 year old who's the career path who used, that you've who had. used to be right. like them. Yeah. So, I mean, you've obviously much more experience in this than myself. So what's the starting point? Because it's, it's something all companies and, and talent teams have a focus on right now. It's under, it, it's, understanding that there is a need for that to begin with, right? Understanding that there's been a lot of science and a lot of research that a diverse group produces uh, at a higher rate than a homogeneous group. For example, this is a quick anecdote, the Apple Watch, right? It has all these trackers and cholesterol, et cetera, the first generation, it has all these different types of things that track um, whatever, whatever, sleep pattern, et cetera, et cetera. Well, there's something that women track, has tracked for many, 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 many years. It's that's their menstrual cycle. First generation iPhone, uh, I, um, Apple Watch did not have that because the designers were all men. Mm. Add in a woman in there, they could have easily said, hey, why don't we track this? Because it's a natural thing that people has tracked over the years, right? So that this that one opinion can change everything. So I think that understanding that having a diverse group and people seeing an issue and a problem in many different ways, you can come out with a lot better solution and a lot more comprehensive solution, right? Apple Watch would have been more comprehensive in terms of their tracking if they only had one woman in that team. Mm. Uh, when designing the features right. yeah you agree uh, that diversity of thinking exactly and then interview training as well uh like i said i hired a lot of sales folks and you wouldn't believe that sometimes i would get feedback uh, uh of a candidate and they said they will say things like 
oh, that person, it, you know, there's too aggressive, um, strong, a little too strong, kept interrupting me, really was a little more stubborn. And one sentence and a challenge pushback type of uh, thing I would say is, okay, well, would you have given that same feedback if this person was a man? And you'd be surprised on go, I think so, but they'll always say, I think so. But you'll start to see the shift in their mindset when they're now starting to interview people because that same trait, aggressiveness, uh, interrupting, pushing back in a sales role can be seen as a positive thing for a man, but can be seen as a detriment for a woman. And I think as a recruiter, I was asked once what the difference, you know, they asked me what the difference is between a junior recruiter and a senior recruiter. Essentially, they're hiring for the same thing, maybe load. But I think the difference between a senior recruiter and a junior recruiter is their ability to leave that team better at hiring than when, than, uh, than when they joined it. A junior recruiter doesn't necessarily have the equipment, the experience to coach, teach, be consultant. They, t- they tend to be more of an order taker, right? What do you need? Yep. Yep. As a senior person, you're now a coach, you're a mentor, you're training them, you're leaving them a better interviewer, you're, you're leaving them a better recruiting at recruiting than when you first joined them. That's what my goal is for all my recruiters. And is that something that you can coach because so many people say in the recruiting and and also sales kind of sphere as well is you know you have personality types that are more inclined to do well in it and you're kind of born with it um yeah what's your view on that the worst thing that some sales managers have done and i keep referring back to sales because i just have had i've hired so many of them um one of the mistakes that they've admitted to me is promoting your top individual contributor to a sales manager. Mm -hmm. That's the same for recruiters. Sometimes an individual contributor is amazing at being an individual contributor, but they're doing so well, the temptation to make them a manager is too great. And then you turn in, you, you, you make them turn into a manager. Maybe they don't want to, maybe they think that's the only way to get more money. And they don't do well, right? It's not their calling. They don't, they want, they want control over everything that they are doing. They don't want to relinquish that control. And as a manager, you have to relinquish some level yeah. of control. Um, so you really have to understand, again, goes back to the person. What's your motivation for moving into a manager role? Is it money? Because that's not a good motivation, right? Is it other things? Maybe, but let's let's look into it and dive in deeper. Um, so you got to really understand the person. You got to understand the team individually instead of just being a hammer. Mm. And they say about hammers is when you're a hammer, everything's a nail, right? <laughs> yeah. Very true. I think that's the same across all industries. So we here at Ventilate obviously do a lot of tech recruitment, software engineering. Um, and so much, so often, because it's so hard to find engineering managers and leaders and really good ones, mm. they'll just make the best engineer um, a manager. I think it's getting better now, but back in the day, that's absolutely what every company did. And it led to very toxic workplaces. And obviously, I'm biased because I speak to the engineers who want to leave these companies. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but nine times out of 10, it's about the manager that people want to leave. People don't leave jobs. People leave their managers, right? That's that's how the saying goes. Yeah. Um, it's better for tech. It's better for tech work, not tech as an industry, but technical roles. Because like you said, nowadays, there's a career path for an individual contributor in yeah. the engineering um, organization, right? You could be a staff engineer, staff two, architect, guru, whatever. But I think for a lot of the GNA roles, one of the reasons why there's there's a pool to be a manager is because that's the only way you can keep you can break that uh, the the high limit of your uh, compensation cap. Yep. So I think that's I, I, yeah. 
I, I speak to so many engineers who um, they get to that staff lead level and it's pretty, it's very, very well paid, uh, yeah. but they kind of want to try out management and then, but they don't want to kind of leave the tools for too long because they lose their sharpness and that's where their whole value is. Yeah. And I, I speak to these really senior switched on people who almost have like this existential crisis. And I suppose people in other industries have that as well, where they almost have this identity crisis. They don't know which path to go down. I mean, how many heads of talent I've met and I, I, I know and when, when we talk, they sometimes say, I can still source. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it feels like they, they need to prove themselves that they can still yeah. do the individual contributor pieces, um, even though their job is completely different now, right? Uh, I'm guilty of that. I mean, I, so I, don't, I still love taking on roles and, you know, reaching out to people, getting the high of them responding to your email and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm, this, this, this role actually sounds amazing. I want to talk. Hmm. Right. Well, that comes back to what we were saying earlier, because I think it is tangible, isn't it? And you just kind of want that gratification validation mm -hmm. again, that, that instant feedback, uh, which you don't get, as you said, in, in head of roles where things get a, a bit murkier. Because it's true. It's true. So, and the imposter syndrome is very, yeah. very, prevalent on during the transition between an IC to a manager. Um, you hold a lot of managers in high regards. I've been lucky enough to have had some amazing managers throughout my career. And I just take some best practices from them. And I think recruiting is unique that you have visibility to a lot of people in the company. I think recruiting is the one of the few com uh, uh, in organizations within a company that can interact with every single person in that company yeah. um, because you're hiring for them, right? You're trying to understand your culture. You're trying to understand what works best for the infrastructure team in France. Uh, the, you know, you said UK, I worked at unity and we yeah. had a, um, an office in Brighton. We had an office in Southampton at one point. And I think the London office is still is still open. And when we hired salespeople there, especially in Brighton, you know, hey, why the why are you looking in Brighton? Well, people in Brighton and there's amazing sales folks. Well, guess what? They they they're driven. They'll go to London. Yeah. <laughs> they don't stay in Brighton. So now you have to understand kind of why they're hiring in Brighton. I mean, it's 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 all just holistically understanding your clientele instead of just going out there and just trying to find people. Mm, absolutely. I wanted to touch on another topic as well, as I see the clock is ticking for us. Um, this podcast is about speaking to people who are building the teams in technology that are building um, and developing teams as well. So we speak to engineering managers um, about their hiring, but also how they develop these teams. Um, but on the building side, the hiring side, um, Internal talent teams play a huge part in that. Uh, and also external agencies play their part as well. Some people disagree on how big the part they play is. Obviously, I'm biased. Um, now, I've known firsthand and I've spoken to talent leaders the world over just how good an external partnership can be to an internal talent team or, or a, a hiring manager. But I've also seen and heard horror stories of how bad it can get as well. So someone who's been on both sides of the fence and I guess dealt with a lot over the years, what do you think makes a great external recruiting agency staffing partner? I think communication, 100%. Uh, you will get, if it's a good third-party uh, talent agency, you'll only get what you give, right? You'll give as much as, you'll get as much as you give. If you give them the time, the effort, access to hiring manager, uh, understand kind of their strengths, weaknesses. I've worked with agencies um, to help build sales environments, like entire sales team from BDR, sales managers, technical solutions folks. And they've been amazing, but I've always been tentative. I've always shared a job description. I've always been transparent with them. I treat them like they are part of the company. And the big value there 
is that when it's done, you know that the engagement is over and you can pick them up, you can call them again when something picks back up. If you don't have a relationship with any third party companies, you're forced to maybe hire contractors internally. When the work is done, you may have to let those the contractors go. You may have to learn, learn some, uh, uh, let some full-time employees go. The flexibility that an agency offers is irreplaceable, right? That's why I keep really, I have several relationships with many different agencies based on what I need. And I reach out to them if, if we have a hiring spree all of a sudden, if we need to hire in India, if we need to hire in the Philippines, if we need to outsource something in uh, outside of the United States, if we have a big migration project that I need 10 SRE engineers that have um, Google Cloud uh, experience because we're transferring from AWS to GCP, right? I mean, we need the 10 people tomorrow. Yeah. Your team can't wrap up, can't wrap up that fast, mainly because they're probably already overworked. So now yeah. you reach out to someone like like you, Alex. It's like, hey, I need, <laughs> I need 10 people tomorrow. Mobilize your team and get me those resumes. So I think the the message here is, you know, ha cultivate a relationship with several different top agencies out there. And then when you do, we do bring them on, bar, on board, give them a fair shot, give them a fair chance, give them exactly what they need in order to succeed because your, their success is ultimately yours as well. Yep. So there you yep. go. As someone on, on the other side, I totally agree. Um, you're just more motivated as well to, to work with a company that's willing to give you time and yeah. obviously appreciate that the work you do as well. And a, a good agency recruiter isn't going to work something that, you know, is going to be a dead end or, you know, go down a, a rabbit hole. So yeah, you need to be open. Uh, it's not a competition between the internal team and the agency. It, it needs to be a partnership. There you go. Exactly. Exactly. As an agency recruiter back in the day myself, I was motivated by hiring managers who were responsive. Mm. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's a no, it doesn't matter if it's a yes or no. It doesn't matter if they keep rejecting all my candidates, as long as they're giving me feedback and they're pointing me to the right direction and they're course correcting me along the way, I'm happy to source and keep sourcing for them. But you go dark on an agency recruiter. Well, yeah. guess what? there's other three, four other companies that are actually responding. So I'll spend my time there. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's good to hear that because I know a lot of agencies get a bad rep and I think as well, it's hard for a lot of agents, especially maybe if you're starting out, uh, we're going a bit off topic, but in terms of getting your clients and the amount of approaches that someone like yourself or internal talent people get, um, you know, you can just become one of the many and, and not really stand out. As an agency, I rely on my network to vet agencies for me. Yeah. Uh, it's my first go-to. I have a Slack channel with a few talent acquisition, VP level, director level, heads of talents, et cetera. And when I need a sales agency or a recruiting agency for tech, I will ping that network first. Who can you recommend? Right. Um, I think a cold email can sometimes be a little rough, but, and like you said, folks like myself get two or three a day yeah. for either follow-ups or net new emails. So you really need to kind of find a champion and an evangelist and then use them. Maybe even when you're reaching out to someone like myself, let them know, Hey, we've worked with XYZ from Dropbox. Hey, we've worked with, you know, this other company from industry, you know, ILM, right? Industrial light and magic. If you're, if you're targeting that in that that uh, that field, et cetera, et cetera. Mm, yeah, that social proof. Because there's so much noise. There's so much noise in anything now. Even I get emails from not like re obviously recruiters, but just just everything you could ever think of. I'm sure you're the same. Just software or tools or recruiting tools. 
just everything. Yeah, you didn't. You do. You do. How do you how do you vet them out? You rely on your network, and then you rely on people that's just making sure uh, they look out. They're looking out for your bell, your own best interests. Because there's just way too many bad agencies out there, Alex. Yeah. Right. And then there's just way too many bad recruiters out there. I think this is another topic for another time. Yeah. But you know, bad recruiters that make our industry look bad. Like people who it's another to, yeah, people argument. that go to people that just don't follow the process and it's just sad. One mm-hmm. they've had a bad experience on a recruiting from a recruiter, that recruiter doesn't know what they're talking about. How many times have you heard that, right? Mm. So, anyway, I digress. <laughs> no, it's it's another case for the correction, isn't it? Another it will probably weed out the the bad people who aren't serious about the craft of recruiting and they'll go somewhere else. Exactly. Like their heart this is not this is just not on it in it. Uh they don't don't really just have that empathy for people. I think that's very important to be good at what you do, to be good at recruiting. Because at the end of the day, we're part of the people organization. So we have to put people first. And we have to lead with empathy. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. So what about you? We'll wrap up soon. Um, mm. You've done agency, you've done in-house, you've worked at tech companies in the Valley, you've seen technical changes like you've never seen and you've built TA functions, scaled organizations. What's left for you to do? What's happening That's... for you in the future? <laughs> you know, if you asked me this seven years ago, I would have said, oh, you know, of course, leading an entire people operations, people team from HR to recruiting. That's going to be not my answer. <laughs> my answer is to stay in recruiting and really create a best in class white paper on how recruiting should be in the valley. I think that's my ultimate goal in life is to be to to write a process and to write kind of a a, a document where Starbucks is using it now or Palantir or mm. fa- uh, Facebook or whoever, all these other companies. Um, I don't know if you remember, but the Netflix culture deck, have you heard of that? Yeah. Culture deck I've back seen in it the day, right. a few times. 56, I don't know how many pages it is, but there were a lot of people that were interested in that. And a lot of folks actually based their culture, their, their, their entire HR infrastructure on that deck. Because at the time it was really good. I don't know how it is now. But that's something that I'm striving for, right? Curate processes to the point where this is best in class and should be adopted to other companies. That's where my career, that's where I'm aiming for. We'll see how long that's going to take. It's, I still have a lot to learn. I still have a lot of different areas of uh, growth that I need to be in, that I need to focus on. So We'll see. Maybe in the future, you'll find you'll write you'll you'll read a a, a a process document or a slide deck for me. Amazon yeah. bestseller. In yeah. Recruiting. <laughs> there, yeah, there you go. Write a book. Let's write a book. You and I yeah. can collaborate on it, Alex. <laughs> yeah. Well, apparently, it's pretty easy to call yourself an Amazon bestseller because you just have to pick a subcategory that no one's ever written about, and technically, you're an Amazon bestseller. So that's why everyone's an Amazon bestseller. Recruiting in antarctica yeah well, there you go that's a sub that's a subcategory <laughs> and then if you sell five books you are now an amazon bestseller that's the way to do it right. moses thank you so much for your time and your wisdom i loved hearing about that the way you come across and uh, the way you speak i know we'll, we'll give a lot of value to a lot of people out there so absolute pleasure thanks for the opportunity alex good chatting with you man take care So you made it to the end. Well done and congrats. The fact that you're even here shows that, well, maybe you you learned a few things and got inspired by the story and career of our guest. If you really did like it, then please tell your friends and colleagues. And if you want to keep up to date with new episodes weekly, then be sure to hit that subscribe button. Take care of yourself and thank you so much for listening.